Okay, everybody, we're back. Uh, we've talked about, man, what have we talked about? We've talked about soil tests, we've talked about our biology, we've talked about base phosphorus, saturations, base saturations, phosphorus, potassium, economics, data, economics. We, we're running the gamut. And so, we're we not done yet. We're getting close, but I still got a lot of things I want to talk about, <laughs> Bodie. So, what about nitrogen? Let's talk about uh, let's talk about bacteria that convert organic in to inorganic in are called ammonifiers. So these are microbes that convert organic in to inorganic in through an ammonification process. Organic in is that nitrogen which is not plant available. We've talked about this a little bit. Yep. And once converted by the ammonifiers, is released as ammonium. So that would be weon on the soil test, right? That's right. W E O N. If you remember that from the soil test. That's what that measurement is, organic yep. nitrogen, right? So the holy grail of agriculture to me is nitrogen, right? That's the one thing For that sure. everybody wants to try to master, and it's slippery, okay? Every time you think you're getting close, we're probably, the more we learn, the less we know, yep. right? So this is what I love about these products. How many ammonifiers are in 401 and 501? And we're not afraid to talk about this. We have 28 strains uh, of ammonifying bacteria between the two products, and so, we have 20 that overlap that are in both. Each product has four unique strains as well. And so when we put those two together, we have the ability to take organic nitrogen and make it plant available. So this I is think different, huge. right? This is different than what a diazotroph that you referenced earlier? Right. So I referenced a diazotroph, and we'll get to that here in a couple of slides, but, but this is just taking nitrogen that's already there. So right? this is pulling from a different pool This is a different nitrogen. pool of nitrogen. This is nitrogen, you know, especially in, say, a manure, an area with manure history, where you may have a lot of organic in that's not been plant available. It's there, all right? Instead of spending more money applying more synthetic nitrogen, Let's use what we've got there, and then you know, then we can utilize the diazotropes, or we can utilize our synthetic end to get us where we need to go. Makes sense. So a 401 inorganic, uh, excuse me, 401 meltdown inorganic in 2021. Uh, so right at the beginning, treated, untreated, and the pre before any applications were made, we had more, uh, we had more in in the treated area, right? And so. When we look at it uh, at V4, we've got about 42% more in at V4. We've got about 12.5% more at V12. We've got 12% more at R3. So again, we've talked about this with P. We've talked about this with K. Our biology is working throughout the growing season. What it basically means is when I said we've got 42% more at V4, what that really means is we've got about 32.5% increase in inorganic N at V4 over the pre-sample. So what that says is, yeah, we had an advantage already at the beginning with pre. And so it was actually, when we take into account that advantage was there, we were still 30% more inorganic in at V4. So as soon as that biology goes in the soil, it goes to work. By the time we get to R3, we still 10% more inorganic in throughout R3. And like you mentioned earlier, this doesn't take into account what the plant's taking up. This is throughout the growing season, and the plants suck that nitrogen out of the ground like a straw throughout the entire time, and those biology are still are still converting that in and making more of it available. So if you go back there, is it safe to assume that if if there was a yield advantage, right? If there was something, we talked about Liebig's law of the minimum, that you're only as good as what your lowest limiting factor is, right? Sure. But so is it safe to say, and again, you said that this does not account for any sort of uptake. This is just looking at soil availability. If I had more yield, and we believe uh, a lot of what research has done, and they say, you know, 1.1 to 1.2. Now, we're not talking about applied nitrogen, right? We're talking about 1.1 to 1.2 pounds of N per bushel of grain, right, created. So if I had a 15 bushel advantage early on, right? Because sure. those plants know. They know if they're carrying an advantage. Would it be safe to say that, you know, there's like a 30 pound advantage to our meltdown 401. If I look at 44 and a half pounds versus 31 and a half, I look at a 15 bushel advantage times 1.2. Are we getting close to 30 pound advantage with this? I think we're getting there. I think that that's absolutely possible. When you see numbers like that, and if that's what your outcome is, then you can make that assumption. The, the, the issue is, is that you could have this and have a different yield number, right? So we don't know how much nitrogen we're making available because that's determined to buy the pool of nitrogen that's there. So it's hard to just say that we get X if we do Y, right? Or if we do Y, we get X. However, 
if we have this determined, if we have 10 pounds of organic ant is all we have, and our biology converts that, or if we have, uh, you're going to talk about in the next slide, a pool of organic ant that's like 80 pounds of organic ant. And if you have a larger pool, you have potential to convert more nitrogen. And so that's going to be determined by that pool of N that's available. Well, here's the data. This on the left here is a soil test um, pre-treatment. Um, so this is a part of the 365 grower that I was working with. Um, you can see there that his organic N that, uh, that uh, Sean referenced was 89.1. Um, that's in the pre-treated sample. Um, <clears throat> so back to the soil test, right? You asked, how am I using a soil test to make a recommendation? Okay. Mm -hmm. this, this all started because a grower was taking soil and tissue. And he got a tissue back and he didn't feel that his nitrogen was high enough for the yield potential or the yield that he wanted to play in. And so he sends me a message and says, hey, um, got my tissues back, right? Tissues typically come back before soil does because you can run a tissue report right. significantly quicker than what you can a soil report. So tissue comes back and he's like, my end's just not good enough. Like, I got a, I got a Y drop. And I said, well, how much are you thinking about Y dropping? And he's like, 60 pounds. And I said, well, did you take a soil sample? He said, yeah, I took a soil sample. And I said, well, let's wait then. Let's wait and see what the soil sample says before we just go out and put another 50 or 60 pounds. So we got the soil sample back and it said we had 288 pounds estimated to release. Total in, right? Mm -hmm. Almost 300 pounds of in estimated to release. And this is about V10. Yeah. Okay? 89.1 is my organic in. So that pool that you talked about, we don't know whether we have a 10, uh, organic pool of 10 pounds, whether it's 89 pounds, whether it's 130, we don't know. With a soil test through Agronomy 365, we know that that pool in this particular case is 89 pounds. So what we did is, is we did Y drop. I did agree to, uh, to let him Y drop, <laughs> um, but it wasn't any nitrogen. Clearly, the data shows that we had plenty of nitrogen, but we did have a fairly large pool of organic in. So what we did is we Y-dropped meltdown, uh, and what we were doing simply with that was trying to convert that organic in pool. So we wanted to use, and I'd already had 401 in furrow, and I had not put meltdown on yet. And at this point, if you haven't seen the importance of meltdown in 401, I'm not sure either one of us <laughs> can help. What we did was I wanted to use Meltdown to bring that complementary effect that we see with 401, but to convert that organic in to inorganic in or a plant available in through the ammonification process. What you're seeing on the right there is, is the soil sample that was taken about two weeks, three weeks after treatment. And we had converted that from 89.1 down to 35.6. So we were actually able to convert that pool and make that available to the tune of about 54 pounds. Mm -hmm. right, we were able to convert 54 pounds and release it as inorganic nitrogen. In the meantime, our nitrogen release went from 289 pounds down to 129 pounds. Mm -hmm. And again, that's because we're in that V10, 11, 12, that 1,000 GDU time Rapid frame uptake. where we've got massive amounts of uptake occurring. Look at your biological number, too. Look at your HT3 between them. Yeah, we went from a 54 to a 74. Yeah, so you, you know the biology is working. It's cranking. It's it's respirating. It's doing its work. So here's the soil sample that was taken. This would have been uh, with the first soil sample. Um, so this is the nitrogen level that you know I guess he was a little bit disappointed in. Um, he was looking to hold a little bit higher than a 354. And the one thing about tissue testing, if you've heard me speak before, you're probably tired of it. Uh, if you haven't heard it before, as a plant gets bigger, as a plant has more biomass, your nutrient concentration goes down, mm -hmm. right? We know that simply because the tissue test is, is a acid digestion that is reporting a concentration of those specific nutrient in the sample that you have. So if I have more biomass there, you know, you look at you and you look at me and you know, you're an okay looking guy, but you look at myself, you know, I have slightly larger biomass than you do. It's right, slightly. Slightly. And I could have a lower nitrogen reading than what you do, even though I have more pounds of nitrogen in me because it doesn't take into account the Absolutely. biomass. So anytime that tissues can maintain or build while you get a bigger plant, that's a good day in yeah. our world, right? We, we love to see that. So this is the pre-sample. This is the post-treatment sample. 
There's another couple things that are interesting here. Look what our phosphorus does. I don't know if you paid attention to this because we were so keyed on nitrogen, but phosphorus is a 0.45. It actually goes up to a 0.5. Phosphorus went up. We actually built. Well, what have we talked about with meltdown and with 401? We kind of talk about phosphorus, don't we? Yep. Pretty fascinating. Look at calcium, right? We haven't talked about calcium, but look what calcium does. Calcium goes up. Now, why, why could, and this again, this is a hypothesis, but I like to do this because it's thought provoking and it's challenging. But we know that cations and anions form complexes, right? Mm -hmm. We know that opposites attract. I didn't marry somebody that's exactly like me because I don't want to live with somebody exactly <laughs> like me. Phosphorus being an anion, mm -hmm. calcium being a cation, calcium diatriphosphate, an insoluble bond that's not available to the plant, mm -hmm. right? Well, I don't know, draw your own conclusions at home. Pre-sample, 0.45 phosphorus, 0 0.40 calcium, 0.5 phosphorus, 0.56 calcium, Again, I don't want to lead a horse to water, but draw your own conclusions. I made phosphorus available. We'll As a calcium. result, yep. we know that we're releasing acids or enzymes that break calcium and phosphorus away. Did we break that bond? Maybe we're getting a benefit that we don't necessarily talk about. Sure. So, okay, we talked about ammonia fires. Now we talk about N2 fixtures. So N2 fixtures are called diazotrophs. All right. So, how many N2 fixing bacteria are in 401? We've had six. We're going to add one more in two th for for 22. And so we've had uh, we've had six that were there. So these are these are, are are bacteria that are atmospheric fixing nitrogen. They fix N2 gas from the atmosphere and convert it to plant available nitrogen in the soil. And so uh, what's interesting is this is this new one that we're adding. Uh, it's going to actually be like intracellular, right? So it's going to produce nitrogen basically throughout the plant. And so we're going to have nitrogen stored at the cellular level. So that's really exciting for me is to, is to have a different form uh, of a diazotrope or an N2 fixer uh, in that system. And so we also look at 501. There are two N2 fixers in 501. And so when we use those two in conjunction with each other, we end up with, with the ability to have seven plus two uh, in two fixtures. This is huge. I think the thing that you're right, it is it is absolutely huge. Um, but I think a couple things need to be pointed out here. One is, you know, that, that we're not going to stop and we're not going to be complacent with where we are. Mm. Um, that's number one. If, if we know that there are bacteria or fungi out there that can complement what we're doing with Meltdown and 401, can bring value to our growers. We're going to look at put that out there. We're not going to sit here today and say, oh, we, we have what we have. That's all we're going to do. We're not going to do anything else. We're not looking at anything else. We're always looking to improve. And I think that we should be, right? Right. This one, as Sean talked about, it, is, is very interesting. Most of your N2 fixers are going to create a symbiotic relationship with the plant, and they're going to hang out there, and they're going to create that, that, that atmospheric. They're going to take the atmospheric nitrogen, turn it into an available form. And where Sean said, this one is going to do that, and then it is actually going to move throughout the plant and deposit the nitrogen throughout the plant. It is, it is a, it's a newer form of bacteria that we have not had in our blend before. Um, we are adding it in for 2022. And maybe the most interesting thing is, is that Dr. Farley will not compromise. And what I mean by that is, is that he's not going to add one in that could potentially harm three or four or sure. five others. The other thing to note is, is that not genetically modified, right? Non-pathogenic, naturally occurring microbes. Now these aren't, they, we're not putting these in there just to bolster our numbers. It's, it's got to have a relationship and it's got to be symbiotic with what's already there. So here's one that, um, it was a grower that I was fortunate to work with. Um, he had, uh, it was, this was 2020 data. Um, this is in 270 plus bushel corn. Um, he wanted to compare 401 versus a competitive biological company that is, is talking about nitrogen. And, you know, we, while we don't sit here today and say, use 401, cut 10 pounds out, use 401, cut 25 pounds out. I think a lot because Sean did a great job explaining. We don't know what that total organic pool is that we're playing with. We don't know what what environments, we don't know the carbon load, the available carbon that's there for 401, how successful can they be throughout the entire growing season, you know, how much nitrogen has been applied in that mm -hmm. system. There's a lot of things that we don't know that we're not gonna sit here today and say, 
use this and cut out, you know, 50 pounds, 20 pounds, 10 pounds, whatever that number is. Uh, but I thought it was interesting to take these microbes, put them head to head, and take, again, soil and tissue. I use 365 to prove and disprove products. I use them to learn about ours. Growers across the U.S., they're using them to find efficiencies. Mm -hmm. They're using them to create healthier plants to drive that top-end yield potential. And what you're looking at is, is a series of weekly tissues, uh, 401 versus a competitor, and you can see that we held a 5.3% uh, advantage uh, on nitrogen with 401 that equated to a 5.4 bushel advantage over the competitor. This is one that uh, I think it's easy for Sean to align with, um, but this is something that I'm, I'm very big on. Um, I really challenge our sales guys, talk about things we know, talk about things we can prove, and really what that is, and Sean put it in a, a much um, more political <laughs> wording, um, managing expectations for realistic outcomes. Um, the take home message regarding diazotrophs is this. There are less into fixing biology due to historical fertilizer applications. And in the presence of high amounts of nitrogen, diazotrophs will grow vegetatively rather than fixing nitrogen. So what does that mean? Well, what that means to me is this. If I have a diazotroph that wants to create nitrogen, and again, remember that biology doesn't do anything that it does for anybody else other than itself, mm -hmm. right? It does what it does because it's a function of who they are, mm -hmm. and they do it if they have carbon and if there's a need, right? So you right. think about mycorrhizae, and we don't want to go down that path, but if, if, if a plant doesn't send signals for mycorrhizae, it's not going to colonize, right? right? So high levels of phosphorus, you struggle to get mycorrhizae colonizations. Well, what that tells me is, is with diazotrophs, it's the same thing. If I apply a lot of soluble nitrogen up front, right? So nitrate, plant available nitrate, plant available ammoniacal, those diazotrophs may not do. It goes back, I guess what it goes back to is, is that's the reason that you won't tell me that it's 20 pounds or it's 30 pounds or it's 40 pounds. That's right. Because if you've got a lot of nitrogen up front, then, then the research data that we're reading says that they get kind of lazy. They, they, they uh, An N2 fixer or a diazotroph isn't really going to fix a lot of nitrogen if there's a lot of nitrogen there. And the reason for that is, is that because the process is so strenuous, for lack of a better word, it is it, that, that, that those diazotrophs aren't going to do what they are supposed to do because of the energy toll that it takes on their system. Sure. And they're not going to go through it for the sake of just going through it. If they recognize that there's high levels of, of nitrate or, or nitrogen in general there, it's not gonna do what it's supposed to do. Um, so it is, like it's just gonna hang out. It's just gonna be there. And again, I think that that's maybe an important thing to note, you know, if you're asking yourself, well, how are these guys, right? Bodie and Sean, they're talking about biodyne, they're talking about BW, how are we different? How is our biological company? One is it's the team, mm -hmm. it's the diversity, it's the multitude of different nutrient solubilization bacteria and fungi that we bring. We're not just focused on just nitrogen. We're not just focused on just phosphorus or just potassium right. as we're learning or sulfur or iron. It's we're focused approach. on the team yeah. and the system.